That's good, I guess. Revelation chapter 2, if you would, please. I'm asking you nicely. But I ain't going to ask again. No. Revelation chapter 2. We've touched, I think for the most part, on Satan's seat. Let me... um, Let me read this and we'll touch on one more aspect of it and then we'll move on. I mentioned this last Sunday that I would probably look into this and the commendation that Jesus made uh, to the church at Pergamos. I mean, here they are. We know that Satan is dwelling in that particular place and that is biblical. Uh, The idea that devils live in earthly places, they dwell in cities, they dwell in areas. I mean, do you believe that there are parts of town that devils really like to live in? Maybe you used to visit. Um, I, we had a guy here years ago that um, I knew that in the past he had had a drug problem. And apparently it was going on while he was coming to church here, unfortunately. But he would drive from Jefferson County all the way up over into Brooklyn, Illinois, Brooklyn, Illinois. Now, everybody here is going, yeah, Brooklyn, Illinois is not someplace you want to find yourself at one o'clock in the morning buying drugs. It's one of the worst places there is. There's murders, shootings, there's a organized crime there, gangs, you name it, okay? And there, it is a habitation of devils, is what it is. They dwell there, certain kinds of them. So here is this church, literally, in Satan's town. Satan says, I own this town. I own everything in it. I own everybody in it. Sounds a little bit like Washington, D.C. Somebody say amen. Amen. By the way, the Constitution is still in charge. Um, Got a call from somebody in our church and they were asking about it and asking about Romans 13. I ought to teach on that this morning, but Romans 13 means what Romans 13 says. It does. God does place us under earthly rulers, whether we like them or not, whether they're saved or not, whether they're evil or not. Sometimes God will force good people under cruel authority to force us to rely upon him and not kings and governments and princes of this world. Amen. But I, I said, think of it this way. You still believe in the Constitution, don't you? Yeah. I said, that's the authority. That's the we don't have a king who has supreme power in this country. We have a written law that even the president, the Congress and the judges are supposed to go by. If they don't go by them, that's not on us. It's on us to abide by them. The written power, which is the Constitution and the laws that are given under that Constitution. That is our authority. And that's the authority that we, the people, are going to and should follow. Amen? So, but there's going to be bad rulers. Think of, think of, here I am not teaching on it. Think of the Apostle Paul. I'm going to give you an example out of the New Testament. If anybody knew right and wrong, it was Paul. He knew what was right. Jesus himself appeared to him taught him doctrine, taught him the mysteries, taught him everything Paul's writing, everything from Romans to Hebrews, Paul wrote it all. How many times in any of Paul's writings or in the book of Acts do you ever see the apostle Paul railing against Caesar? One time? Two times? Five times? Zero. Paul and Caesar was a supreme ruler who thought he was God. He thought he was God. That is the, that is the idea of the Antichrist. 
He thinks he's a man who thinks he's God and rules with absolute authority. But there was a written code of laws in the empire of Rome. And when the Jews sought to kill Paul for preaching the gospel, what did Paul do? Did he get his AR-15 out and start shooting everybody and say, I don't serve anybody but God? No, he immediately turned to this Roman soldier that was holding him and said, are you going to let these Jews kill a citizen of Rome? And the soldier went, you're a citizen of Rome? He said, with great, he said, I paid a lot of money to buy my citizenship to be a Roman citizen. How'd you get it? Paul said, I was born that way. Paul was born and had the rights of a Roman citizen, which means that he had a right to appeal to Caesar. And that is exactly what Paul did. You never, ever, ever, ever see Paul rebel against Caesar's authority. Not when he used Roman law to have a fair trial for him. To keep the Jews from killing him. Okay. Now did Paul. At some point. Did Paul get killed. By Caesar. Yes. Did he ever complain about it. He never did. He still kept on preaching. He never stopped. He never. Even if. Even if they told him don't preach. He preached. And God allowed him, even while Paul was in prison, he was under house arrest. He was in staying in somebody's house under house arrest, and he was still preaching the gospel till the day he died. So if we're going to, if we're going to be Christian Americans, let's be Christian first. Americans second. Let's follow the rules. That God has set forth for us. Somebody say amen. Amen. I know that burns some people. But I'm going to preach on. I'm going to preach on truth today. And I know I'm going to make some people mad. And I've been fighting it all weekend. I have. I've asked certain people to pray for me on this message. Because it's going to rub some people the wrong way. Uh, And I may say things. I've prayed that God would give me a meek spirit about it. But you know that. In the last few months, I have been deeply disturbed over people following what they hear on the Internet. And they're equating that as gospel truth. And that bugs me. It bugs me greatly. Uh, let, me, let me get to what I wanted to show you this morning as far as uh, the throne of God. Turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And... This is a sort of a mainstay teaching that I have. I've taught it many times, but I'm going to apply it in this particular issue where Jesus told them that they dwell in the city of Pergamos where Satan dwelleth, where Satan's seed is. He ruled there, he had his throne of authority there, and he dwelled there. And we've been talking about how Satan wants to rule over the heavens he wants to rule over the congregation he wants to sit in the seat of the most high we saw last week how the philistines went and got the ark of the covenant which was god's throne and they brought it to dagon dagon represents the antichrist the man of sin who wanted to sit on god's throne we get that from second thessalonians 2 verse 3 let no man deceive you by any means For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God, he as God, capital G God, the God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And the problem is, more than 7 billion people, if they are alive on that day, are going to believe it. And it's going to be, they're going to participate in it. 
just because some cuckoo somewhere in the Middle East sits down on a throne somewhere and says, I'm king of the world. Does that, do you go, oh, he's king of the world. We better, we better do what he says. You can't control people like that. There's only one way. Men have tried it before. Men have tried it. It doesn't work. You can't control everybody. Not yet. But there's coming a day when that's going to happen. And so it says in verse 6 or verse 5, Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. That's his word. And shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Uh, that's him, the Lord shining like the sun. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. In Revelation 13, the dragon gives him his power, his seat and great authority. What authority did the devil have? Well, remember, he took Jesus on the pinnacle of the temple and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And he said, see all these kingdoms? I'll give them to you if you'll bow to me. Did he have them? Yes. He had them. He is called in the Bible the God of this world. The prince of the power of the air. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. I almost said Democrats when I said that. But I meant disobedience. And some Republicans too. So that's the working of Satan. Verse 10. With all deceivableness of unrighteousness. Bottom line is. The sin in your life will dictate what you believe. It will. With all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth. There is only one truth in this world. And it's not the internet. It is the word of God. Jesus said, thy word is truth, that they might be saved. So, Revelation chapter 4. And you can do your study on this. Gary's got him a laptop computer that I... It, Dave, you ought to look at it. I think it's from the 80s. It's, yeah, it's a Mac and it's that thick. Mac, Mac, Mac books have been that thick since... What, 1974? Something like that? <laughs> no. Yeah. But anyway, uh, he's going to try to get the uh, pure Bible search installed on it. Gary, I'm telling you, you get that stall installed somewhere, you'll have more fun. You will. you will. You will sit for hours just chasing a word down through the Bible. And doodads will go up and down your back every now. Tears will roll down your eyes. You'll see things that you have never seen before in Scripture. And it just, I love it. Uh, the temple of God, Paul made it very clear. That exact phrase, what know ye not that your body is the temple of God. It's the temple of the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost is God. Same thing. Your body is. So Revelation 4, I preached this in... The way out in the country in Kenya, and they loved it. After this, I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither and I will shew thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow about, around about the throne in sight like unto an emerald, and round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. That's in Isaiah chapter 11. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. So look up on the screen very quickly. I'm going to run through this. 
And then we'll get on into abiding in faith. Many I was in the spirit. Behold, a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne. There is only room in your heart for one master. Can any man serve two masters? No. And I had a guy come up to me one time and he said, Pastor, I don't know if you've ever thought of this. He said, but I was witnessing to a guy that was, uh, uh, he was a Freemason and he was in our church. And I, and I asked the man, how many masters do you have? He said, what do you mean? He said, well, you have one master, that's Jesus, but you go to the lodge and you have a man there called Worshipful Master. Reg Kelly said when he was lost, his daddy told him, son, you need to go join the lodge. And he said, they had me knelt blindfolded. And when they took that blindfold off, I was knelt in front of a man they called Worshipful Master. And he said, I was lost and I knew that was wrong. So I was lost. And I knew that was wicked. I knew that wasn't right. He said, I, he said, I got out of there. That's as far as he went in there. And he's had the Masons in his town come at him because he hands out tracts in his church exposing all that stuff. And Red's told him, he said, what are you going to do? Slip my throat from ear to ear? I mean, he just, he just pulled up at him. He didn't bow down to him. And I'm going, I like you. There is only room in your heart for one master. You cannot serve two. You'll either hate the one and hold the other or love the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot do it. So in Revelation 4, 6, the, before the throne, there was a sea of glass. And like unto crystal, in the midst of the throne, around about the throne were four beasts. The four beasts are the four chambers of your heart. The sea of glass is the pericardium. It is a sack, literally, that surrounds your heart like, a, like an ocean, like a sea, full of water. And what it does, it cushions the heart. Remember, who was that? Dale Earnhardt got killed in a NASCAR race. And to me, the wreck didn't look all that bad. But what happened was, it busted that, apparently it busted that pericardium. And it smashed his heart instantly and killed him. The cushion that was meant to cushion his heart against any kind of jolt ruptured and it killed him instantly. But the four chambers are the four living creatures. Your heart is your life. Your heart stops beating, you die. The pericardium, as I said, is the sea of glass surrounding the throne of God. By the way, your heart... And I'm going to... Rely on my, we have a resident scientist here. The heart has neurons. Am I right on that? Neurons are the parts of your brain that think. Your heart has the ability. When the Bible talks about with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness, it's not making stuff up. It's not just using colorful metaphors. It literally, I believe the heart is where the soul is. Your soul is in your heart. Your heart does your thinking for you. Okay? If, if it's just your mind, somebody can say one thing to you, you believe it. Somebody could come along and contradict that. Now you believe something else. But once something is established in your heart, it's there. When people have it in their, when they've got idols in their heart, God addressed this in Ezekiel 14. God said, you put idols in your heart, then I will speak to you according to the idols that you have in your heart. In other words, if you want to hold on to those idols, you go ahead and everything you believe is going to be a lie. That's dangerous. I don't want any part of that. And here we have the lightnings and thunderings and voices. Your voice box is here. Your heart's here. Here's your voice box. The thunderings and lightnings are the beating of the heart. Heart beats from electricity. There's the lightnings and the thunderings. Sounds like thunder. There were the seven lamps of fire before the throne, which are the seven spirits. The word spirit literally means breath. It's what it literally means. The Greek word is pneuma. And we use that word when somebody has pneumonia, they have, a, they have a lung disease. When somebody uses pneumatic tools, how are the tools driven? By air. So literally, pneuma and spirit, they both mean air, breath, wind. 
And so the seven spirits of God are represented by how many lungs do you have? Two. Well, that's not seven, but it is the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, I want you to notice in that picture, the two lungs, they don't look exactly alike, do they? One of them is significantly different from the other. Okay, and the left lung allows for the positioning of the heart. The right lung has more capacity than the left lung does. The right lung represents the New Testament. Left lung represents the Old Testament. Okay? By the way, when you read your Bible, does it matter where you read it? Read it. Does, when your brain gets oxygen, does it matter what lung it came from? No! It's just glad it got it. Amen? So it rep the two lungs represent the Old Testament and New Testament. The air spirit comes from these three holes in your head. For there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Because whether you got your nose stopped up, you can still breathe through your mouth. Half the time my nose is stopped up. Can't breathe. So when I wear the mask... I Stick it right up there under my nose like that. Lisa says, cover your nose. I said, I can't breathe out of it anyway. It ain't hurt nothing. So anyway, but it comes from the head, comes from above. The lungs are down here where the body is. That's the Holy Spirit. Amen. And then uh, here's your what's called the bronchial tree or brachial tree. Now, that's what it looks like right side up. Let me flip it upside down. Now it looks like a tree, doesn't it? And there are seven branches, just like the seven candlesticks that look that were built like a tree, because the candlestick in the tabernacle was an almond tree. And remember, on these, let me get my pen out here. Now I better not, I won't be able to flip it. But on each one of these sticks here, you had three sets of three decorations. A knob or a knop, a flower, and a bud. So the sum total of decorations on these seven candlesticks was 66. It's the exact number of books in your Bible. This is our breath. All Scripture is given by inspiration, which means the Greek word is theopneustos. Here's that word pneuma again. God breathed. You want, you want God to breathe life into you? Open your Bible up and read it. Amen. And here's the 24 ribs are the 24 elders that surround the throne of God. So, when the man of sin comes, what seat is he going to sit in? I believe that he literally is going to rule and reign out of the hearts of all mankind except the elect. Let me ask you this. Where does God rule from right now? Right here. Have you ever thought things and the Holy Ghost convicted you about those thoughts. But nobody around you knew what was going on. I know there ain't many of you, but raise your hand. That's because the Holy Ghost knows that this is where he dwells. This is where he lives. This literally it. When the, when the Bible says that your body is the temple of God, it's again, it's not just a metaphor. He literally designed it to the letter to be the temple of God, just like the one in heaven, exactly like the one in heaven. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So Satan wants to sit in the seat of God in heaven. Well, God's going to kick him out. So then the man of sin is going to dwell in the hearts of mankind. Think of this. And there's a guy from Australia that I've been having a little conversation with him about this. 
when the, when the legion of devils, we, legion for we are many, when they were going to be cast out by Jesus, they were afraid because he knew that he could put them in the pit and they don't want to be there. And they said, please don't cast us into the pit. Jesus said, fine. And there was a herd of swine, about 2,000. That number is a number for the Gentiles. And he put them, literally, those devils dwelt inside those pigs. Now, what happened to every single one of those pigs? They went into the deep, the Bible says. The deep. When you get that software going, Gary, write this down. Write, get a piece, write this down. The deep. Study the deep. Okay? I'll give you, I'll give you, you call me, I'll give you all kinds of stud, all kinds of things. Gary would be sitting in his house for a week in the same clothes. Not having gone to bed, bathed, showered, eaten, nothing. He'll just be studying the Bible for a week. You study the deep. Because you'll find out it's a picture of hell. They didn't, that's funny to me. They didn't want to go to the pit. Where'd they end up? The pit. But who did they take with them? The swine. Swine represent the Gentiles because they're unclean. And I do believe that at some point mankind is going to be altered to be a beast. Like Nebuchadnezzar was for seven, Bible says seven times. That's what I think is going to happen. Bottom line is, don't let the devil rule in your heart. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Now back in Revelation 2. Go back there. Revelation chapter 2. That was the introduction to the Sunday school lesson. Now, here's the Sunday school lesson for the next 10 minutes or whatever. Revelation chapter 2, verse 13, he said, I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is, and thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith. Even in those days wherein an Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. Antipas was one of their church members. And they killed him. And the rest of the church remained alive and knew that he had been killed because he was a faithful, he was faithful to Christ. The intention of that was to cause the rest of the church members to flee. But it didn't work. There's something that I guess some people never figure out, but if you make a martyr of somebody, everybody else is associated with him, they're not going to run. They're going to rally. Okay? Um, and he says in verse 17, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna. And I have, I have had heard preachers say, we don't have to overcome in this dispensation. That's for the Jews. That's not for us. We don't have to overcome. Now, let me tell you what that is. That is a doctrine that says you can test God and tempt God with all the sin you want. And God still must save you. And that's a lie. You don't tempt God. And usually that same crowd says, you don't have to repent to be saved. Repentance is a work and you don't have to repent. And I've said to that, people who say you don't have to repent, usually don't repent. And we are living in a day right now where the churches are actually in many cases more evil than the neighborhoods around them. 
because they've been told that they can still do whatever they want to, live however they want to, cover up all their sins themselves, never repent of anything, and they still go to heaven. But that's not what the Bible says. First Peter chapter one, turn there. Now, here's the funny thing. What I'm about to read you, those who believe what I just told you will say, well, Peter wasn't written to us. So we don't have to we don't have to follow that. It was written to the Jews, even though it never says that. Peter never said that. Apostle Jesus Christ to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Well, that's us. And he says in verse 7, that the trial of your faith, not of, not of your works, God's already tried our works, has he not? And we've been found guilty. We've already had that trial. We've all been found guilty in God's courtroom, and there's no doing away of that. Except by faith. But God will try our faith. Our faith will be tested. Do you still believe? So let's say that they pull up some evidence somewhere that the earth really is 100 million years old. I don't believe it. And I won't. I don't care what they pull up. I don't think, I don't care if they pull up a picture of a dinosaur writing the date down from the newspaper, holding a newspaper. 100 million BC. I won't believe it. Okay? It's photoshopped. And then they'll say, well, they didn't have Photoshop 100 million years ago. <laughs> I won't believe it. Things like that try people's faiths. And I've told you I, the story. I know a lot of stories, but this one sticks out of my mind. The man that started going to church, he'd already retired as a school science teacher, started going to church. Everybody thought he was saved. The preacher, I know the preacher, King James Bible preacher, preaching out of the King James, Genesis chapter 1, that God created the universe 6,000 years ago in six days. And that retired science teacher chewed that pastor out after the service, called him an idiot. He said, I, don't, he said, I can't believe you believe something that's stupid. Walked out. Found him a church where they don't teach that stuff. His faith... Now, I'm not his judge. I don't know what happened to him since then. I know he's dead now. I'm not the man's judge. But I know, And maybe God corrected him. Maybe he repented some... Maybe he did. Judge no man before the time, the Bible says. But that man's faith was on trial, and he blew it. He was found guilty of not believing what... God said. And if you read Genesis 1, it makes it clear in no uncertain terms the evening and the morning were the first day. Not a billion years was the first day. It tells you it was a 24-hour day. The genealogies tell us that it's approximately been 6,000 years. Not really any longer than that. So do you believe what the Bible says? Or do you, are you going to go along with what everybody else says just because everybody else is saying it? Remember, not many are entering through the straight and narrow gate. Few there be that find it. We'll continue this next week. Father, bless your word, honor your word, keep your word. Hold us fast and tight. To your word. Help us, dear God, to never set it aside. Help us, dear God, to always abide by it. This is our rule book. This is our guidebook. If you said it, God, it's settled. There's no argument. You said it's this way, then it's this way. And I pray, dear God, you give each and every man, woman, child wisdom. Not the world's wisdom, but your wisdom from above. 
Bless your word. Honor your word, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen.